Today and Abgarn, today we're going to be solving May June 2019 paper 1 variant 2. Before we start, we are offering free topic 1 notes. All you have to do is fill in the form in the description box down below. We are also selling topic 2 notes 3 and 4, which include all the tips, tricks of paper 1, and common misconceptions too. Upon purchase, you can ask us an unlimited number of questions about the topic or past paper questions for free, and you are able to exclusively contact us at any time, which is a new and unique service. We also have another monthly service, which you could ask us an unlimited number of questions and past paper questions for the full AS Biology syllabus only for $12 per month. Please contact us by email if you are interested. Question number one. The actual length of a cell structure is 8 micrometers. Which steps are used to calculate the magnification of an electron micrograph of this cell structure? Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. As we all know that magnification is image size divided by actual size. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. For A, steps 1, 3, and 6. For step 1, measure the length in centimeters. Then, for step 3, divide the image length by 1000. Now, what we're trying to do here is converting the image length to micrometers. Therefore, this will not work. Same with B. Now, for C, here is steps two, measure the length of the cell structure in millimeters. Then we need to convert it to micrometers. But unfortunately, step number three says divide the image by 1000. So to convert from millimeters to micrometers, we must multiply by 1000. Therefore, this is incorrect and therefore the correct answer is going to be D. Question number three. Two different types of cell P and Q were broken up using ultrasound and their contents analyzed. Both types of cell contain small circular DNA. The circular DNA from P all carry the same base sequence, but those from Q were two types with different base sequences. What may be concluded about the identity of cell types P and Q? Now, first of all, here, about the circular DNA from these cells, they basically mean that both mitochondria and chloroplasts have circular DNA. And if P has circular DNA, all the same base sequence, this means that it only has mitochondria. But those from Q were two types with different base sequences. So the two types of circular DNA must, must be mitochondria and chloroplasts in this case. The reason for this is that the DNA in the nucleus is a linear DNA, it's not circular DNA. So the only two choices we have are mitochondria and chloroplasts. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. For A, heart muscle fibers. Now heart muscle fibers, as we all know, they only have mitochondria because they are not plant cells. So this might be correct. Lymphocytes, this also might be correct. Mature red blood cells. So mature red blood cells don't really have mitochondria, so this is incorrect. For D, root cortical cells. So root cortical cells only have mitochondria, even though they are plant cells. The reason for this is that they are at the root. Therefore, they cannot photosynthesize it and they do not need to do so. Therefore, they only have one type of circular DNA, which is going to be the mitochondria. Now, for Q, root cortical cells. Root cortical cells only have one type of DNA, as we mentioned, because they cannot photosynthesize. Therefore, this is incorrect. For B, mature red blood cells contaminated by bacteria. So, contaminated by bacteria is also going to be only one type of DNA, because bacteria has circular DNA in the cytoplasm. Therefore, this is also going to be incorrect. C. Phloem sift tube elements. So, phloem sift tube elements is also going to be incorrect. The reason for this is that they only have mitochondria. It's the companion cells which both has mitochondria and chloroplasts, but it's not sift tube elements. So, therefore, this is incorrect. Now, finally, for D. Leave mesophyll cells. So, mesophyll cells, they need to photosynthesize. Therefore, they must both have mitochondria and chloroplasts. Therefore, D is going to be the correct answer. 
Question number four, which features shown in the diagram can be present in viruses? Let's start with DNA. Yes, viruses could have DNA, this is correct, and RNA, this is also correct, but they cannot both be present in the same virus, so it's either DNA or RNA, also known as retroviruses. Two, protein coat. Yes, all viruses must have protein coat, also known as a capsid, therefore this is correct. And finally, for 70S ribosomes, now 70S ribosomes are totally incorrect because why do viruses infect host cells in the first place? It's to use the ribosomes to synthesize its proteins. Therefore, this is incorrect because if viruses did have ribosomes, they would not need to infect host cells. Therefore, the correct answer must be B. Number five, after boiling a sample of milk with Benedict's solution, a yellow color is observed. Which conclusion about the sample of milk is correct? So Benedict's solution is used to test for the presence of reducing sugars. And a positive result would be from blue to brick red at the most extreme. Now, here it says a yellow color is observed. A yellow color, this means that there must be a low proportion of reducing sugars. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. A, reducing sugars are not present. This is incorrect because it did change color. Now for B, reducing sugars are present. Yes, this is correct. C, there is a high concentration of fructose. So fructose is a reducing sugar. However, we cannot guarantee that it's going to be fructose because there are other reducing sugars too, such as glucose. Therefore, this is incorrect. For D, there's a low concentration of sucrose. Sucrose is a non-reducing sugar. Therefore, this is also going to be incorrect. And the answer is going to be B. Question number six, which of these statements about polysaccharides can be used to describe amylose and cellulose? So, amylose is a polysaccharide made of alpha-glucose units joined by alpha 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds. Now, for glucose, they are a polysaccharide as a result of condensation of beta-glucose monomers by beta 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds, where each beta-glucose monomer is rotated 180 degrees. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. One, contains one to four glycosidic bonds. Yes, both of them do contain one to four glycosidic bonds. For two, contains one to six glycosidic bonds. This is incorrect because as we said, it's only one to four. It's amylopectin, which would contain one to six glycosidic bonds. Now for three, polymer of glucose. Yes, both are polymers of glucose and the answer is going to be B. Question number seven, which diagram shows the formation of a peptide bond? So a peptide bond is formed by the removal of a hydroxyl group from the carboxylic acid group and the removal of a hydrogen atom from the nitrile group, which is this one. Therefore, A is going to be the only correct answer and water is released during the formation of a peptide bond in a condensation reaction. In enzyme-catalyzed reactions, the position of the amino acids found at the active site is important. During the synthesis of enzymes, amino acids are brought together in the correct position to form the active site. Which levels of protein structure must be involved in forming the active site? So the active site is formed by the tertiary structure, bonds. Now, here we have the level of protein structure. First of all, we must think, what determines the tertiary structure in the first place? Is the primary structure. Why, you would ask, because each amino acid in the primary structure have a different R groups. And R groups are what determines the bonds in the tertiary structure. Therefore, primary must be present. Same with secondary, too. And as we said, that tertiary structure is involved in the active site. For quaternary structure, quaternary structure is going to be incorrect. The reason for this is quaternary structure is the combination of more than one polypeptide chain by bonds, such as hydrogen, hydrophobic, ionic, and disulfide. Therefore, the correct answer must be B.
Question number nine, which features affect the tensile strength of collagen? So what is collagen? Collagen is a protein and it's formed by the arrangement of three polypeptide chains in a triple helix structure. Now let's see the suggestion that we have here. One, the helical structure of collagen chains is what affects the tensile strength. This is correct because they wind together closely. For two, the small R group of the amino acid in collagen. Now, the amino acid in collagen with a small R group is going to be glycine. And every third amino acid in the collagen polypeptide is glycine. Yes, and it does help with the tensile strength. The reason for this is because it's small, it allows the polypeptide chains to wound around together even more tightly. Therefore, glycine is going to be correct. 3. The insoluble nature of collagen. Now, this does not affect the tensile strength, therefore this is incorrect. 4. The bonds between collagen molecules. Now, collagen molecules are joined together by hydrogen bonds and some covalent. Therefore, hydrogen bonds collectively are very strong. Therefore, they do affect the tensile strength of collagen. And the answer is going to be B. Question number 10. A fixed volume of the enzyme catalase was added to a fixed volume of hydrogen peroxide solution. The diagram shows how the concentration of product changed over the course of the reaction. Now, obviously catalase is the enzyme and hydrogen peroxide is the substrate. And both of these are fixed volumes. And as we can see on the graph that as time goes by, the concentration of product increases. And at the start, the graph is more steep and then it's more less steep until reached plateau. Now, let's explain this in more detail. When we start, there is a higher concentration of substrate, which is hydrogen peroxide. Therefore, there are more collisions with the active sites of the enzymes. Therefore, the rate of reaction is faster. Therefore, the concentration of product at the start is going to be way more than towards the end. And as the reaction proceeds, the substrate concentration decreases. Therefore, there are less collisions for the substrate with the enzyme, therefore less substrate is converted to product, therefore it becomes less steep. Now, once it reached plateau here, this means that there is no more substrate molecules available, therefore plateau has been reached and there is no more product being formed. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. What explains the shape of this graph? A. The active sites become saturated. Now, this is incorrect because as we said at the start it's saturated and at the end there are less substrate molecules so they are less saturated therefore this is incorrect b the enzyme was denatured no it wasn't denatured because if there is product concentration increasing this means not denatured yet now for c the hydrogen peroxide inhibited the reaction also this is incorrect if that was the case then the graph would look something like this Therefore, this is incorrect. The reaction has not been inhibited. For D, the substrate molecules were used up. Yes, as we just said, as the reaction proceeds, there is less substrate until reached plateau where there is no more substrate. Therefore, this is correct and the answer is going to be D. Question number 11. A fixed volume and concentration of substrate and enzyme were mixed. All other variables were kept constant. The enzyme-catalyzed reaction was left until it was complete. Which graph shows how the rate of reaction changes with time? Now, coming back to our last question, this question is also very similar. Now, here on the y-axis, we can see rate of reaction. And here it says a fixed volume of substrate and enzyme. Now, as we all know that over time, the rate of reaction always decreases. It does not increase. Be careful to always look at the y-axis. This is the rate of reaction. Therefore, here we're looking at C and D. These are going to be incorrect. Now, when we start, the concentration of substrate is going to be the highest. Therefore, the highest rate of reaction or the steepest one is going to be at the start. Why? Because there are more collisions with the active site, increasing the rate of reaction. Now, 
As the reaction proceeds, what happens is that the substrate concentration starts to decrease, because here it says a fixed volume, it's not in excess. Therefore, what happens is that the rate of reaction also decreases because there are less frequent collisions. Therefore, it just keeps decreasing until there is no more substrate available where the rate of reaction completely stops. Therefore, C is going to be the correct answer. Now, let's look at D. The reason why this is incorrect is because the rate of reaction cannot increase and then decrease at the same time. This is not an optimum temperature graph or optimum pH. Be careful of the y-axis. Therefore, this is incorrect and the correct answer must be C. Question number 12. The fatty acids, elatic acid and oleic acid have exactly the same structural formulae with one double bond in the chain. However, the shapes of the chains are different, as shown in the diagram, which shows, shows the effect of the presence of these fatty acids on the structure and behavior of a cell surface membrane. So, the first one, elatic acid, is a straight chain fatty acid. Straight chain means that it's going to pack closer together. This means that it will make the cell surface membrane less fluid. Because a straight chain would mean that they are packing closer together. Now, for oleic acid, this actually would make the membrane more fluid. The reason for this is because we have a kink here and it's bent. This means that the fatty acid chains are not going to bind to each other closely. They are going to bind each other loosely. Therefore, what's going to happen is that the membrane is going to be more fluid. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here for A does not fit closely with other fatty acids. Now, we just said that because it's a straight chain, it fits closely. Therefore, this is incorrect. And for oleic acid fits closely with other fatty acids, this is incorrect. For B, does not fit closely, this is also incorrect. For C, fits closely with other fatty acids, so this is uh, correct for it so that the membrane is less fluid at high temperatures. Yes, because they're closer together, it's going to be less fluid. And for oleic acid, does not fit closely with other fatty acids so that the membrane is more fluid at low temperatures. Yes, it's more fluid at low temperatures and less fluid, elatic acid is less fluid at high temperatures. Therefore, this is correct and the answer is going to be Question number 13, the diagram shows a cell surface membrane which is a correct role for a labeled molecule. Now, let's see for W is involved in controlling membrane stability. So, as you can see here that W is a phospholipid. And phospholipids don't actually control the membrane stability. What does this is called cereal molecules. Therefore, this is going to be incorrect for B. X is involved in active transport. So, X here is an ion channel. And ion channels are always passive because they cannot use up energy. Therefore, they can never be involved in active transport. Therefore, this is incorrect. For C, Y is involved in cell signaling. Now, for Y here, we could see a protein molecule bound to a glycolipid or a glycoprotein on top. Therefore, this is a receptor molecule. And when an antigen binds to that receptor, the cells are stimulated to release cellular mechanisms. Therefore, this is correct and it is used in cell signaling. Now, for D, Z is involved in diffusion of ions. Now, Z is called cholesterol molecule. Therefore, this is incorrect because you can see here it's cholesterol. What's involved in the diffusion of ions is going to be an ion channel or channel proteins. Therefore, this is incorrect and the answer is going to be C. Question number 14, the diagram shows a simple cell signaling pathway in which a signal molecule leads to a response such as secretion, which row identifies P and Q. Now, let's see the process of cell signaling in the first place. So what happens in cell signaling? What happens is that the stimulus causes cells to release ligands or signaling molecules. Therefore, they are released in the bloodstream, for example, as a media of transport. Now, these ligand molecules or signaling molecules bind, have a complementary shape or precise shape and bind to a complementary receptor on its target cell. 
Therefore, it's specific for only one type of cell. Once the ligand has bound to a receptor, the G protein are released and therefore a signaling cascade is triggered within the cell. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. For A, activated enzyme in cytoplasm and target in cell surface membrane. They actually should be the opposite. First of all, the ligand binds to the target, then enzymes are activated in the cytoplasm. Therefore, this is incorrect. For B, lipid in cell surface membrane, extracellular enzyme. Now, extracellular enzyme is incorrect. It should be intracellular enzyme because the reactions happen inside the cell. Therefore, this is incorrect. For C, protein in cell surface membrane, then activated enzyme in cytoplasm. This is correct. The ligand bound to a receptor, which is a protein in the cell surface membrane, then this stimulated a cascade of reactions and activated enzyme in cytoplasm. Therefore, this is correct. And the answer is going to be C. For D, target in cytoplasm and protein in cell surface membrane, they should also be the opposite directions. Therefore, the answer is going to be C. Question number 15, three parts of a chromosome and their functions are listed. Which part is matched with its correct function? Now let's first label the functions for P1, centromere. So centromere, as we can see here in the diagram, is found at the middle and it holds the two sister chromatids together. Therefore, P1 should match with F2. Now for P2, histone proteins. Now, the DNA coils or wraps around those histone proteins. The reason for this is that the length of a DNA molecule is almost 2 meters, and it must be condensed into that 10 micrometer nucleus. Therefore, they are wrapped around histone proteins for this case. Therefore, it should be matched with F1. Now, for P3, telomeres. Telomeres are strands of non-coding DNA found at the ends of the chromatids so they are found here and they prevent the loss of genes or gene shortening therefore it should be matched with p3 and f3 and the answer should be in this case b with p2 and f question number 16 the enzyme telomerase prevents loss of telomeres after many mitotic cell cycles which cells need to transcribe telomerase enzyme now as we said earlier that telomeres prevent the loss of genes and prevent gene shortening because they are found at the end of chromatids. They are strands or bases of non-coding DNA. Now, the cells which need to transcribe the telomerase enzyme and that's what forms the telomeres at the end of chromatids, these cells must be the cells which divide rapidly. Why you would ask? Because each time a cell divides, the length of telomeres slightly shortens. Therefore, the cells that divide the most must have the greatest amount of telomerase enzyme to restore those telomeres so the cell doesn't die. Therefore, for one, cancer cells. As we all know that cancer cells actually have a high amount of telomerase enzyme. The reason for this is that it divides uncontrollably. Therefore, cancer cells are correct. For two, stem cells. As we all know, also stem cells divide unlimited number of times to provide cells which could differentiate. Therefore, they must also have a high supply of telomerase enzyme. For three, activated memory B lymphocytes. Now, first of all, when an antigen is encountered, B cells are activated and stimulated to divide into plasma cells, which secretes antibodies complementary to that antigen and memory B cells. And now, when an antigen is countered once more, these B cells are stimulated to quickly divide into plasma cells and more memory cells to release antibodies. Therefore, also B lymphocytes need to divide rapidly. Therefore, all three of them is correct and the answer is going to be A. Question number 17, the diagram shows some of the stages which take place during the cell cycle. Which two stages take place during interphase? Now, interphase is divided into three stages, G1, S phase, and G2. In G1, there is a high proportion of protein synthesis inside the cell to prepare it for the S phase. Now, what happens in the S phase is semi-conservative DNA replication, so the DNA is replicated. 
Then in G2, this cell continues also to grow and there's a high rate of protein synthesis of tubulin to prepare it for mitosis. Therefore, let's see the suggestions that we have here. One, numbers of DNA molecule doubles. This is correct and this happens in the S phase. Two, cell growth. Yes, it does grow in the G1 and G2. This is correct. Three, chromosomes become visible. Now, this is incorrect. Chromosomes become visible at the start of prophase, so early prophase. And four, nuclear envelope disappears. This is incorrect because nuclear envelope disappears in late prophase, not in interphase. Therefore, three and four is incorrect, and the answer is going to be one and two, which is A. Question number 18, which statement correctly describes the base pairing in a molecule of DNA? A. The purine adenine forms bonds with the pyrimidine thymine. Now, first of all, you must identify which are purines and which are pyrimidines. Now, purines are the larger bases and they are made of two rings. Now, purines in this case are adenine and guanine. Now, pyrimidines are smaller and they are only formed by one ring, so pyrimidines are cytosine and thymine. Now, once we've got this clear, let's see the question. The purine adenine forms bonds with the pyrimidine thymine. Now, this is correct, and the answer is going to be A. For B, the purine adenine forms bonds with the pyrimidine uracil. Now, this would only be correct if that was an mRNA, because here it's asking about DNA specifically, and DNA does not have a uracil, it's mRNA. Or RNA, therefore, this is incorrect. See, the purine cytosine forms bond with the pyrimidine guanine. So, in this case, guanine is actually a purine, and cytosine is actually a pyrimidine. Therefore, this is incorrect. Now, for the the purine guanine forms bonds with the pyrimidine thymine. Okay, they've got the purine and pyrimidine right. However, we are we all know that guanine actually forms three hydrogen bonds with cytosine, not with thymine, therefore this is incorrect and the answer is going to be A. Question number 19, which statements about complementary base pairing are correct? So complementary base pairing is a phenomenon in DNA where adenine binds with thymine and cytosine binds with guanine via hydrogen bonds. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. 1. It allows translation to occur. Now, translation is when a tRNA molecule with an anticodon bind with an mRNA molecule and this happens in the ribosomes also by complementary base pairings. So for example, if the tRNA has uracil, then the mRNA molecule is going to have adenine. This is complementary base pairing between the anticodon on the tRNA and the codon on the mRNA, so this is correct. For two, purines and pyrimidines are the same size. Now, this is incorrect because purines contains two rings and pyrimidines contain a single ring. Therefore, purines are larger than pyrimidines. And purines are, by the way, adenine and guanine. And pyrimidines are cytosine and thymine. So this is going to be incorrect. The base pairs are of equal length. Yes, the base pairs must be equal length, no matter their sizes. So for example, looking like this. The reason for this is that if these full base pairs were different lengths, this means that the shape of the DNA would actually be distorted with a shorter part and a longer part. And to maintain that constant shape of DNA, they must be the pairs, not the bases themselves, of equal length. Therefore, this is correct. Therefore, uracil forms two hydrogen bonds with adenine. This is correct also. Uracil forms two hydrogen bonds with adenine and cytosine forms three hydrogen bonds with guanine. Therefore, this is correct. And the answer is going to be B. Question number 20, the diagram shows the possible organization of DNA molecules after one replication. Which organization is correct? Now, as we all know, DNA replicates by semi-conservative DNA replication by means. There is one strand from the original DNA molecule and one strand from the newly synthesized. Therefore, one might be here and this is the newly synthesized and also one might be here and this is the newly synthesized for example therefore this would look something like this and c is going to be the correct answer question number 21 the diagram shows parts of the dna sequence of a gene and the mutated sequence of the same gene 
what are possible effects of the mutated sequence. Now, here to make it easier for the students, I have converted the DNA sequences to mRNA to make it easier. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. 1. The presence of mRNA stop codons. Now, mRNA stop codons are these three. When I've converted them to mRNA, this is incorrect. We cannot see any stop codons here. Therefore, this is incorrect. 2. A change in the sequence of amino acids. Now, as we all know, a mutation is always the change of sequence of amino acids, and we could see this by here. The sequence have totally changed. Therefore, this is correct. For three, a non-functional protein. Yes, when the sequence of amino acids have changed, this creates a non-functional protein. Why, you would ask? Because each amino acid has its unique R group. This means that the bond interaction with each amino acid is going to be different. Therefore, if the bonds are different, this could result in a non-functional proteins because what determines the properties of proteins are the, their bonds attached. Therefore, this is also correct. Now for four, ribosomes cannot translate the mRNA. Now, the ribosomes actually can translate the mRNA. There isn't an error in translation. It's still able to read them and a complementary tRNA molecule with that mutated base sequence is still going to visit the ribosomes. However, this does not mean that the protein is functional, but it could still be translated. Therefore, this is incorrect. And the answer is going to be D. Question number 22. What is correct for flowing sieve tube elements? A. Companion cells provide structural support to the flowing sieve tube elements. Now, companion cells don't actually provide the support. They only provide the carbohydrate or sucrose to the phloem sieve tube elements by passive diffusion through the plasmodesmata. What actually provides the structural support is the parenchyma cells. Therefore, this is incorrect for B. Lignified walls of phloem sieve tube elements prevent transport of mineral salts by mass flow. So, lignified walls that don't actually prevent the transport of anything. Lignified walls are just present for structural support, therefore this is incorrect. C. Flawed sieve tube elements become narrower as movement of sucrose occurs. Now, this is actually incorrect. The reason for this is when sucrose is found at the companion cells, they move to the flawed sieve tube elements by passive diffusion through the plasmodesmata. Now, what happens is that there is now a higher concentration of sucrose inside the flawed sieve tube elements. Therefore, what happens is that now there is a lower water potential, so water from adjacent cells move into the phloem sieve tube elements by osmosis down water potential gradient. So actually, it does expand. It does not become narrower. Therefore, this is incorrect for D. Plasma does not allow movement of water in solutes across cell walls of phloem sieve tube elements. Now, this is correct. The companion cell moves sucrose into the phloem sieve tube elements through the plasmodesmata. Therefore, this is correct and the answer is going to be... Question number 23. The diagram shows transverse sections of parts of a plant. Transport tissues are labeled 1 to 6. Which combination shows the tissues that have the main function of transporting water? Now, the tissues that transport water, as we all know, is going to be the xylem. Now, let's identify the xylem out of the leaf, stem and root. Now, in the leaf, the tissue present upwards is always going to be the xylem and the one present below is going to be the phloem. You must memorize this point. In the stem, the one present on the outside is going to be the phloem and the one present on the inside is going to be the xylem. So, one and four is correct. For the root, here, the cross sign is going to be the xylem and the circles to the outside is going to be the phloem. So now we have 1, 4, and 6, and the answer is going to be B. Number 24, the statements are a description of how water moves across the root to the xylem vessel elements. Which statements describe the apoplast pathway? So the apoplast pathway is the intercellular movement of water through cell walls. So the water is moving through cell walls of cells. 
Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. One, water enters the cell walls. This is great. They do enter the cell wall and travel through the cell walls in the apoplastic pathway. For two, water enters the cytoplasm by osmosis. Now, this is totally incorrect. In the apoplastic pathway, water never enters the cell. Now, what actually enters the cell by osmosis is the symplastic pathway. Therefore, this is incorrect. For three, water moves from cell to cell through plasmodesmata. So, what moves through the plasmodesmata is also the symplastic pathway. So, this is incorrect. For four, water moves through cell walls. So, here, because it moves through cell walls, therefore, is going to be correct and the answer is going to be C. Question number 25, four plants A, B, C and D were grown in the same conditions and their transpiration rates measured. Which plants is most likely to be a xerophyte? So xerophyte plants have adaptions that allow them to live in hot conditions where water and nutrients are scarce. Now, they have properties which decrease the loss of water from them. Now, here we could see the transpiration. So, the one that's going to be a xerophyte would most likely have the lowest rate of transpiration because, as we said, that xerophytic plants have features which enables them to lose the least amount of water, for example, a thick cuticle or stomata in pits. Therefore, the answer is going to be D. Question number 26. Sucrose moves from a mesophyll cell in a leaf into the phloem sieve tube elements, which changes to the water potential in the volume of liquid in the phloem sieve tube elements are correct. Now, let's first outline the process so you students are able to understand it. Now, let's assume that this is the companion cell and this is the sieve tube element. And this is the cell wall of the companion cell. First of all, the companion cell starts by pumping hydrogen ions to its cell walls by proton pumps outside the companion cell. Now, sucrose is synthesized by adjacent mesophyll cells and are present at the outside. Now, what happens is both hydrogen ions and sucrose move back into the companion cell through something called a co-transporter protein. co-transporter protein by hydrogen ions down concentration gradient and sucrose against concentration gradient. Now sucrose is present in the companion cell. Now what happens is that, is that the sucrose moves into the phloem sieve tube elements through the plasmodesmata down concentration gradient. Therefore what happens now is that there is an increased sucrose concentration in the phloem sieve tube elements and a lower water potential in the phloem sieve tube elements. Therefore, what happens is that water from adjacent cell moves into the phloem sieve tube elements by osmosis. Therefore, the volume increases. And then sucrose moves down by mass flow. Now, let's see suggestions that we have here. Water potential becomes as you said, the water potential decreases. And if it decreases, this means it's more negative. And less negative is a higher water potential, so this is incorrect. Now, volume of liquid, we just said, because there's a lower water potential, then water would move in by osmosis. Therefore, the volume would increase. And the answer is going to be D. Question number 27, the diagram shows a cross section through a mammalian heart. Which chambers of the heart are represented by W and X? Now, first of all, we must identify where is our left and where is our right. Now, here we can see that this side is the thickest. Therefore, it has the highest amount of cardiac muscle. Therefore, this side X must be the left side and side W must be the right side. The reason for this is that the left side pumps blood to the body, to the rest of the body. Therefore, it has to pump it at a greater pressure and it's able to do so by an increased amount of cardiac muscle. Therefore, W is the right side and X is the left side. So once we made this clear. Now, we must identify whether it's a ventricle or an atrium. Now, first of all, this is definitely going to be a ventricle. 
both of them are ventricles. The reason for this is if that was a cross section through the atrium, as you can see here, you would clearly see the pulmonary valve and the aorta looking something like this. And it would not look a V-shaped. Therefore, it's impossible that this cross section is a atrium. It's going to be a ventricle and therefore the answer is going to be D. Would be eight. At a certain point in a cardiac cycle, the pressure in the right ventricle is lower than in the right atrium and lower than in the pulmonary artery. So if the pressure is low in the right ventricle, this means that now it's ventricular diastole. This phase is where the heart fills up with blood. Now, which row is correct? We're talking about the atrioventricular valve and semilunar valve. So, if the pressure in the right ventricle is lower than the atrium, this means that the atrium has a higher pressure. And the valve that's between the ventricle and the atrium is the atrioventricular valve, right here. And if the atrium has greater pressure, this means it's able to push the valve open. Therefore, the atrioventricular valve must be open. Now, for the semilunar valve, here it says the pressure in the right ventricle is low. Therefore, it's unable to move the semilunar valve or push it open. Therefore, it remains closed and the answer is going to be C. Question number 29, the diagram shows the pathway for the transport of carbon dioxide that occurs in red blood cells. Which row is correct? Now, as we could see here, in the transport of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide binds with water, combines with water, and forms carbonic acid. So two is carbonic acid. By what, you may ask? By the action of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. Therefore, once the carbonic acid has formed, it actually dissociates into both hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Now, the reason why I put the hydrogen ions at 3 and put the carb bicarbonate ions at 4 is because bicarbonate ions leave the red blood cell while hydrogen ions combine with hemoglobin forming hemoglobinic acid now hemoglobinic acid has a lower affinity to oxygen and therefore oxygen is released into body tissues now let's see suggestions that we have here for one we have carbonic anhydrase and two carbonic acid three hydrogen ions and hydrogen carbonate ions Therefore, the answer is going to be B. Question number 30. The diagram shows a transverse section through an artery. Which statement describes the tissues present in layer X? So, first of all, let's label the different tissues in arteries. The inner layer is tunica intima. The inner layer is tunica media. And outer layer is tunica externa. So, for X here, we're looking at the tunica media. Now, in tunica media and tunica externa, there's a mnemonic to revise. It's CES. Both have collagen, elastic fibers, and smooth muscle. But be aware of an extra tip point that was first mentioned in another past paper question. It would ask you, what is the main tissue in tunica media? So the main tissue in tunica media is actually elastic fibers. And the main tissue in tunica externa is going to be collagen. This came in a past paper question and it was a common misconception, so beware. So coming back to our question, we have both CES, collagen, elastic fibers, and smooth muscle, and the answer is going to be D. Question number 31, the large arteries close to the heart have a thick elastic layer in their walls. Which statement about this layer are correct? So here we're talking about elastic arteries. Now let's see suggestions that we have here. One, helps to maintain the blood pressure in arteries. So, yes, this is correct because elastic fibers are able to stretch and recoil. So if the pressure is too high, they are able to stretch to lower the pressure. And if the pressure is too low, they are able to recoil to increase the pressure. Therefore, this is correct for it to reduce this friction within the arteries. What reduces the friction is the endodermis. Therefore, this is incorrect for it prevents too much pressure bursting the artery wall. As we said, it, it's able to control the pressure. As you said, it stretches and recoil. Therefore, it's going to be correct. And the answer is going to be B. 
Question number 32, which tissues are present in walls of a trachea and an alveolus? So, trachea contains, yes, both goblet cells and smooth muscle and cilia. So, trachea is going to be correct here. This is incorrect and this is going to be incorrect. And for an alveolus, it does not contain goblet cells or smooth muscles whatsoever. It only contains a layer of squamous epithelium. Therefore, this is going to be correct too, and the answer is going to be A. Question number 32. The surface tension of the layer of liquid lining the alveoli tends to pull the walls inwards, so alveoli could collapse. Which statements could explain how this is prevented? So, this is only prevented by one thing. It's called pulmonary surfactant. So before we explain what pulmonary surfactant is, we must explain the mechanism. Now, the liquid lining the alveoli, we know it's water. And water have a strong tendency for cohesion. Cohesion is the binding to each other by hydrogen bonds. Now, therefore, what happens is that the pulmonary surfactant actually separates the water molecules from each other. Because if they got closer together by the cohesion force, the alveoli would just collapse. Therefore, what happens is that the pulmonary surfactant separates these water molecules away from each other. So the alveoli maintains its shape. So it's only by one thing. Therefore, let's see the suggestions that we have here. One alveolar fluid is moved around by cilia. This is incorrect. Alveoli don't even have cilia. Two elastic fibers keep the alveoli open. This is incorrect. Three, epithelial cells secrete chemicals which reduces cohesion. Yes, this is correct, it's pulmonary surfactant, and the only correct answer must be D. Question number 35, which row correctly identifies the causative organism for each disease? Now for cholera, the causative organism is Vibrio cholerae, therefore this is correct, mainly these only have to be memorized. Now for measles, measles have actually been removed from the syllabus starting from 2022 onwards, but measles is a virus and is caused by Marbili virus. Mycobacterium is actually Mycobacterium tuberculosis and it causes tuberculosis. Therefore, this is incorrect. And this is correct for smallpox. Smallpox are actually caused by variola. And for tuberculosis, it is formed by Mycobacterium tuberculosis as we just mentioned here. Therefore, the correct answer must be C. Next, the following advice was given to a person traveling to a country where there has been an outbreak of an infectious disease. Which infectious disease would this advice help to protect against? Now, cook food well and eat it hot. So cook food well will protect against bacteria and viruses because the heat would cause the death of the microorganism. The second point is peel fruit and vegetables. Yes, this would prevent the person from ingesting any type of microorganism but it still doesn't identify which infectious disease this is. Now, drink only cool boiled water. Now, because water here has been mentioned, it's kind of clear for us because as we all know that cholera is transmitted by fecal oral route via contaminated water with sewage. Therefore, if it says only drink cool boiled water, this means it's mostly going to be cholera. Now the next point, wash hands often with soap and cold boiled water. Here it's also mentioned boiled water. Therefore, this also might be cholera and the answer is going to be A. Question number 37, what is a social factor that affects the spread of malaria? So because here it says social factor, it must be a factor that has something to do with the people or the population in general. So let's start with A, an increase in drug resistant forms of malaria. Yes, it does increase the spread, but it's not a social factor. B. Climate change. Yes, also climate change does affect the spread of malaria. The reason for this is that the insect vector carrying plasmodium, and it's the pathogen causing malaria, is female anopheles. And female anopheles prefer hot, humid weather. So climate change could impact the spread of female anopheles, which are the insect vector for plasmodium. But it's not a social factor, so this is incorrect. See, difficulty in producing a vaccine still not a social factor and by the way the reason for this it is correct uh, and the reason for this is that because plasmodium is a eukaryote so it has a higher antigenic variability therefore it's difficult producing a vaccine for d migration of people because of wars 
Now, yes, this is a social factor, and the answer is going to be question number 38, which are specific immune responses? One, phagocytosis. So phagocytosis is actually innate immune response. Innate immune response is the non-specific because phagocytosis, anything could be phagocytosis. For two, production of antibodies and production of memory cells. So this is the adaptive immune system or the specific immune system. Now, for antibodies to be produced, this means that the antigen must bind to a complementary B cell receptor. And this complementary B cell receptor, the B cell, produces antibodies which are complementary to that specific antigen. Obviously, it divides first into plasma cells and plasma cells secretes antibodies which are complementary to that antigen. Therefore, it's actually very specific to that specific antigen. Therefore, two and three are going to be correct and the answer is going to be C. Question number 39, newborn babies have natural passive immunity. What is correct for this type of immunity? So, natural passive immunity is transferred to the baby via breast milk and these are antibodies, not antigens, be careful. Now, immunity is temporary. Yes, because it's antibodies which are transferred, not antigens, therefore this means it's temporary. The reason for this is that the body breaks them down. Brings us back to the next point, antibodies are broken down by the body. This is correct, therefore the answer must be A. Question number 40, the diagram shows three different types of antibody structure. Which row is correct? Now for A, let's see immunoglobin G. One binding site for an antigen molecule. Now as we could see here, we have two binding sites. Therefore, this is incorrect. Now for B, two heavy chains. Yes, in immunoglobin G, we could see here that we the long ones are the two heavy chains. We have two of them. And there are two light chains. Therefore, this is correct. Now, first see two hinge regions. So hinge regions is the area at the middle and it gives flexibility to the antibody. Therefore, we only have one, not two. So this is incorrect for the two light chains. This is correct. As we just mentioned earlier, for immunoglobin A, two light chains. Now, in this case, we would have four light chains. So this is incorrect for B. Four binding sites for antigen molecules. Yes, we have here one, two, three, and four. So this is correct for C. Four heavy chains. Yes, this is also correct. Four heavy chains. We have here one, two, three, and four, the longer ones. And for the four hinge regions. As we mentioned earlier, the hinge region is present at the center here. Therefore, we only have two. So this is incorrect. Now, it brings us back to immunoglobin M for the final one. And A, two heavy chains. Obviously, this is incorrect. It has 10 heavy chains. For B, five hinge regions. So this is correct because we have a hinge region in each one of them at the center here, which gives the antibody its flexibility. So this is correct. And then five light chains. Now it's supposed to be 10 light chains because we have two on each part. Therefore, this is incorrect for the 10 binding sites for antigen molecules. This is also correct. Therefore, the correct answer must be B. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you find this channel offers you any value, I'd highly appreciate it if you would subscribe and like this video. If you have any past paper recommendations or ones you struggle with, please leave them in the comment section down below.